right from the beginning. It's very exciting. It's full on World War II. Welcome to War World. In this episode, we find Maeve again. We've been kind of wondering where she was, and you got a little tease of it at the end of one. Right around the same time the Westerns were being made, you had the classic war films. So it felt like a logical jump for us that she would wake up in yet another genre. Maeve waking up in a world called War World, uh, one of the theme parks. She sees that we're in the middle of war-torn Italy, just around 1943. We went looking around the world trying to find a place that would evoke that moment. And then we looked at Spain. Bethelou was a pretty frozen time in the main town square where Maeve opens the shutters. We wanted an expansive area, which involved bringing in truckloads of sandbags and barricades and uh, tanks and German vehicles we sourced from all over Europe. How'd she get into this mess? She has no clue about why she's there. Maeve is inside a mystery that she has to figure out. Maeve is used to waking up in different worlds and digging under the apparent reality to find the truth of those worlds. But in this episode, she's going to have to dig a little bit harder. Maeve is reunited with Lee Sizemore. I saw you die. Did you? He says he got healed and takes her to the forge. He starts asking strange questions. She never gave you the coordinates? She realizes that he isn't a human. He is something else. Then walls start to vibrate, and the system is kind of overriding itself a little bit, at which point our film frame goes from spherical to anamorphic, which is the aspect ratio. All of it is. <laughs> because that is the language we used in season two to depict a simulation. And we're not here. So where the fuck are we? Glitches have always been a part of the show, ever since season one with Old Bill. But we really rely on the actors more than anything. We haven't touched a single thing from Stubbs. That's all him. We understood from last season that he is a host, but Bernard doesn't know that. So Bernard discovers him pretty much dead, and he comes to. You're one of them. And the way he comes to and the choices he made. Of us, I mean. Were spectacular. No shit. And what we discover is there's a programmed relationship between them, and they go on this journey together, and then they become dysfunctional, perhaps sometimes dynamic duo. To pair these guys together gave some of the storylines a little bit of that levity that we wanted to have this season. I thought the parks were shut down. These texts are just waiting to see if they get laid off. People have often joked about Westworld Game of Thrones crossovers. George R. R. Martin likes to joke about that. And so we thought we'd kind of indulge in that for a moment. And who better to bring into the park than Dan and Dave? And they let us borrow their dragon, so they were really good sports <laughs> for the scene. This game is a replica of our world, but it has limited processing power. What happens if you have more complexity? Let's find out, shall we? It's a computer program, essentially. If you open too many processes, your computer will sort of freeze. And Maeve tries to tax this system, this world, in the same way. Wait, what? Fuck. The manifestation of that is the characters within the world start to glitch and freeze. Ci vediamo all'inferno, fascista di merda. Se non ti ci mando prima io. Save you the trip, darlings. We've done frozen moments with hosts where they generally freeze. But in those moments, their hair can still blow because we're still in the real world and the robots are just freezing. In this moment, this is a giveaway that we're in a complete simulation so that everything is frozen, including the bullet coming right up to Simon's face. We took a bunch of the soldiers and we choreographed positions that they could be in that looked really precarious. You couldn't be in this position unless you were frozen in time. 
Yes, yes, yes. 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 We had poles and bucks holding up actors in positions that they couldn't otherwise be in and created this beautiful steady cam shot of a frozen moment that we've added dust to particulate matter in the air, and then of course painted out the poles so that they feel like they're frozen in space. Congratulations. You successfully crippled the simulation. Now what? She hacks into the outside world and uses the robot that she finds there with the surveillance cameras to try to grab her pearl, her control unit, and run with it to freedom. A new thing for us this season is performance capture. We have a small mocap suit that records the motion of what the actor does. Then that data was able to be brought in and animate the Harriet robot exactly in his place. It was important the action of these robot characters have a sense of fluidness to it. What Jonah leaned into was the idea of Harriet really uh, suffering through her death. You know, bringing some kind of human characteristics to the robot. It's cool because you're getting to see a robot chase, but on an emotional level, this is Maeve. We are rooting for Maeve to get away from this entity that has kept her captive, and it looks like she's gonna get away. Then when you see that pearl roll out of Harriet's hand, she's not going anywhere. Maeve awakens yet again, only this time something's different. And it's here that she meets Angaran Sirak. We needed a secret compound for Sirak. Ricardo Bofiel has a cement factory, I think that was built in the 40s, and he converted it into his offices and living space. They don't really allow filming, so we're really honored to have another great architect on the show. There's a level here of taking the old world and transforming it into something new. And that's very thematically connected. So we felt this is a perfect environment to meet Vincent's character for the first time. Welcome to my world, Maeve. To the real world. <laughs>